Ekteki. Right, here we go. We are now live on Equine Voices and uh, Equine Community page. And this is going to be an interview with Justin Dunn, horse trainer from North Carolina and USA. So I'm just going to try and share this with um, another. So bear with me a second. Okay, here we go. So I'm going to share that with. Uh, sorry. <laughs> oh, one person's watching. Oh, four people's watching. Hi. Hi, Martha. Yay. <laughs> okay, so this is going to be, this is an interview with Justin Dunn, and I'm just going to get him on shortly. So I'm just going to share this link. Um, Martha, can you share this with anybody? Da, 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 let's have a look. Justin Dunn. No, it's not going to let me do it that way. Okay. Copy link. Um, so I'm just going to go in. Actually, what I'm going to do is going to do that in a minute and try and share that in a second. Okay. So let's get Justin in and then he can explain what it is he does. Who else is here? Hi from Colorado. So if anybody's using, um, if anybody's watching this, what you have to do, because this is live, this is StreamYard that's streaming to uh, Facebook, you, they have to have your permission or they have to have your permission to use your, your profile picture and your name. So if you don't click on the I'm using StreamYard, um, it will just put your comment up without putting who you are. So somebody's just commented. Right, here we go. Let's get just in it. Okay. So hi, Justine. Hi, <laughs> okay. So I've just explained. There's a few people on, and I'm going to try and share it to some more platforms while you're ch you're chatting. Um, somebody made a comment, but I don't know who it's from, because it's um, this is being streamed through Streamyard. They have to click on a link to say that they've got um, permission to share it because it's Facebook's um, page basically so if they do that then I can see who the who the comment is but so we've got hi from Colorado or is that somebody from your end yeah I don't know I don't know who <laughs> right okay uh Celia sharing so Justin would you like to just explain a little bit about yourself and what it is you actually do for the people that don't know you okay well my name is Justin and uh, just recently moved from Colorado to here, North Carolina, and we have a American Mustang school, and we preserve the American Mustang, and we promote mental health and wellness. So we do therapeutic activities for our armed military forces, special forces, and veterans. We also extend this program to policemen, firemen, EMT, nurses, and <clears throat> what it is is horsemanship and allowing the horses to help people heal from any trauma or stresses that they may have accrued through their professions. Yeah, that, sound, that sounds really interesting. So I know because I, I I came across you, I can't remember when, quite a few years ago, when um, I was just looking for, for uh, just anything Western and, and horses and, and natural horsemanship and different things. And I came across your page and I think it was the horse with uh, Emma and, and Cinnamon, the, the famous one where she was leading, leading through the snow. And, um, and then I think Moon, Moonshine, was your was your other horse that I came across? So that's how um, I found you. I think it was on on uh, YouTube. There's cinnamon. Yeah, beautiful horse. That's uh, yeah. Harley. That's Harley in the background, the black oh. Mustang. We just came out in the newspaper yesterday. So. <laughs> so how how old is Cinnamon? She let's see. She was three in 2014. So she's uh eight no 11 she's 11 oh really 11 years old so okay yeah so she must have been because it was a few years ago when i when i sort of came across it 
Um, and then I see you was doing, I think you were showing how to ride in an arena. Um, and it was without a bridle and you were sat on your horse and you was doing the steering without, without actually doing anything with your hands, with the reins. Um, and I, I was fascinated. It was just such a lovely bond. Um, it was just so nice to see. And I love the fact that you you have your own uh, bitless bridle and you, you promote that as well, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. We, I designed that bridle for my horses to protect them from people that I uh, were in my business, trail ride business, that didn't know how to use the reins. They, uh, they would tend to balance on the reins riding in the mountains of Colorado. So I designed the bridle to increase the, the margin of error, so to speak. You know, they, they, don't, yeah. they wouldn't be able to hurt my horses. Yes, yeah, I remember. I remember you saying that now, um, and I also came across because you worked with children on uh, summer camps. You you helped those with horses. Would you like to explain a little bit about what you used to do there? Well, what it was is I started the trail ride business in Colorado, and uh, I didn't have a lot of money. Still don't. <laughs> yeah. Who does with horses? <laughs> Yeah. So I needed horses to do the trail ride business and I got a lot of free horses. And if you know anything about free horses, there's probably a reason they were free. They needed a lot of, a lot of Lots help. Of problems. <laughs> yeah. Well, I developed a way of training and communicating with horses that uh, kind of launched me into being a horse trainer. So a lot of people in our local area and then all the way over across the nation of United States uh, needed needed training, mm. and in doing that, I learned that there's some deeper things to horses other than the external part that a lot of mechanical training uh, people see in mechanical training. So the depth that horses would share, I realized, wow, I need to uh, I need to kind of experiment with this. So we started a camp for children with cancer. And we did that for six years, and I got to really see, uh, witness horses healing people that, you know, and, and some of the most beautiful people, that being children, because they don't have, they're not guarded like adults. Mm -hmm. They have the, uh, you know, they don't have ulterior motives, a lot of baggage, I guess we could call it. And they're, uh, they're really open to the horse's abilities to heal so i basically just took out a notebook and started taking lots and lots of notes from the horses you know i was kind of like the little fly on the wall like just sitting there watch the horse watch the kid watch the horse <laughs> watch the kid. and and then i developed an understanding and <clears throat> once you get that understanding uh it's 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 hard to explain, but it's one of those things I'm very grateful to be a witness of it because the horses are doing things I can't train into them. They're doing things for people that people are worthy to receive, but it's through the horse's understanding that they're open to receive it. Mm -hmm. It's something that has to happen between that human and that horse I can't create it and I couldn't even destroy it. Uh, it's, it's something that is uh, available. All that I can do is facilitate it to happen. And uh, being able to do that with the cancer camp for six years, it opened more doors to do what we're doing today with the elite special forces of our military and allowing them to come out and Oh, tap into that very beauty that I can't, I can't create. It's it's there and available, but it's uh, tough to explain. Yeah, but, uh, I get to witness it. Yeah. So so when the veterans come, so how does that work then? Are they um, directed to you, or do you? Um, is it through advertising? How how does it work that they get to come to your place and? and experience, um, you know, being with the horses. Is it, is it through like medical, um, 
medical assistants and they sort of um, pass you on, uh, pass them on to you sort of thing? Well, it's interesting how it worked. Uh, in moving here, I didn't even have an idea or, or an understanding of how it would work. I just knew that I wanted to get somewhere very accessible because in Colorado, I was hard to reach. It was 35 miles from the nearest grocery store. So it was a little tough to reach. I wanted to get somewhere where people could reach me and I wanted to be back by the ocean. My wife loved pine trees. And then I also like the mountains. So North Carolina just seemed to fit and all those. But as the needs aren't really understood, the universe understands. So putting me here, right here, I couldn't have been in a better location to share with the people that need it the most as being right here where our Army Special Forces are pretty much centrally located. I'm, I'm 10 minutes from the base. Wow, that's really good. Yeah, so in, in just doing some local clinics and newspaper ads, <laughs> the right people found what we were doing. And to answer your question, probably in the briefest form is yes, psychologists that were looking for an out of the box type therapeutic activity for for people in need, uh, reached out to me and came in. We designed, you know, we worked closely in designing something that is you know, aligns with my beliefs and concepts and fundamentals and horsemanship, but also can cross over to the clinical aspect of therapy, uh, the four walls of clinic, you know, human to human yeah, therapy. Yeah. And uh, in developing that, it's proven, you know, it's almost like we're pioneering something and there's all kinds of horse equine assisted therapies and learnings and all these labels. But I designed this one based off of uh, wild Mustangs in the mountains of Colorado, uninterrupted by man as much as possible. <laughs> and I streamlined a method to open that door as quickly as possible for the best benefit of the therapeutic advantage and the peripheral benefits uh, to to flow organically, so to speak. Yeah. Um, yeah, because if, if we do something like that in... Oh, there's a bit of feedback there. That's, okay, let's see if that goes away. Yeah, if we do something like that in the UK, we have to have um, psychologists so you, you can... If you're... Uh, experience with horses you can do that but you have to have extra training or you have to have like a psychologist work alongside you in case something happens and then they've got to sort of take over um so that we do have that that we do have that um therapy here but it's um it's a little bit more um difficult to get into and it's not usually just sort of one person it's got to be like a, like a team of people as, as far as i know anyway but um, we have like we have riding for disabled and where uh, disability people with disability can go along and uh, and they can ride and they can interact with the horses. So and that's really nice to see because you can see a child or, or um, an adult that doesn't communicate with people and then you put them with a horse and they just have an instant bond with them and you can see the horses interacting with them and the ponies and they just this have their their own communication which is really nice to see and you can see them blossoming um so that that yeah so what you do must be so rewarding but also you're helping the um the mental um the trauma that they go through as well as well as the physical trauma i'm assuming yeah so the really neat thing about what we're doing is there are those programs here that you have to have a psychologist helicoptering around and you have to have a team of people. Mm. I streamlined it to where I get out of the way as quickly as possible. So I, I show people the doorway to go through and being proactive to upgrading themselves. Yeah. So the five levels that I created as I'll walk them through that 
in interacting with a horse through the two pathways of communication. But as we collectively advance, the the conversation between human and human pretty much goes away. For for instance, a level five guy will come here and they've gotten to level five in probably less than a month and less than 10 hours of communicating with a horse. We may say 15, 20 sentences back and forth in three hours. So what happens is I try to throw them into a feedback loop with that horse to where they have to totally go into a focus with the horse and themselves and then back to the horse and themselves. So this feedback loop is circular. If I'm talking or another psychologist is talking or another volunteer is talking, it interrupts that feedback loop. Yeah, absolutely. It can't, it can't be as organic or as um, pure if there's outside influences. Because what happened in the cancer camp, we'd have six to 10 volunteers and everybody has an opinion and everybody has a perspective and it, it starts to get distorted. The feedback loop gets distorted and it's not, it can't flow as circular as you'd like it to. I mean, even, even if I say you know, something in a therapeutic session with one of my participants, I just divided their attention from the horse and from the engaging in that feedback loop. So I'm very cautious of, of even talking. You know, it, it's, it's great to talk and communicate in the beginning to get the understanding and open these doors and show them where to go and how to do it. But as, it's, as they, they get advanced and come out here, there's very little conversation and very little human interruption. So to see, to, when I say witness, I literally just witness. I watch. I don't. I don't. Uh, I'm not a therapist, and yeah. I don't. I don't try to take that kind of a role. Now I, I engage with psychologists to set up things that they can see and they can be involved with and interact with at the right timing. But in order for a person and a horse to truly go through those two pathways of communication and exchange energy in that circular feedback loop. It, it has to be no interruption. So just to clarify, we have programs around in America that you have to, you know, by the rules of whoever, you have to be licensed and whatnot. Mm -hmm. we, we haven't run into anything like that because, you know, my therapists are horses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's that's really interesting that you've um, that you've said that, like, like explained about just being quiet and allowing um, the horse and the person to just communicate. Because a lot of the communicating is is nonverbal. It's it's the um, the intent and the energy that flows between them. So if you interrupt them, then you're 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 stopping that flow, as you've said. But um, and to explain that to people that that want to know what's happening, um, how can I say? The unseen energy, what's happening? There? Yeah. So so when you're ex when so I un I understand I understand that. Um, but for somebody that's just interested in it and they're watching, they want to ask questions, they'll ask questions and, and they don't realise that when you're doing that, you're stopping what you're... So if, if I was working with with a horse um, doing what I do and I'm sort of just listening and, and just seeing what I'm getting and then they ask me some questions, I'll often say, let me just... Uh, I'll speak to you in a minute, but I just need to be quiet now. It's not that nothing's happening, it's just... Um, there's, there's a non-verbal communication going on. So, um, and that's this, that's what you've just explained, but you have to explain that to people because if they're not aware of it, they, they don't. Yeah. They, they might be looking, but not seeing. Does that make, am I making sense? Sure. Yeah. Well, the, the internal pathway of communication, the unseen energy that's transferring between horse and human, hmm. give it to you an example. If once a person starts to interact 
through the internal pathway of communication. The breathing is going to sync up. So a person that's short breathing, short breath, they have restriction in their mind based on trauma or stress. They have confusion or anxiety, uh, all these labels, depression, anger, whatever it is, it's restriction in the mind. Mm. It's causing tension in their body. So whenever they present themselves to a horse and they, they, they get their, they consciously get their mind on the horse in this moment, they're not dwelling on the past, worrying about the future. They're thinking about right here, right now, presenting themselves to this horse, their thoughts, their emotions, their attitude, and their action. Thoughts and emotions are the internal pathway of communication. Not that the horse, I explain it this way, not that that horse is reading your mind, in, in which cases I know that they can, but to explain it to people, they're not reading your mind, they just read your energy. Your, mm -hmm. your energy has shifted and they pick up on that. And as you collectively engage with them, they start to get a muscle memory or a thought memory of your energy when your thought is in the moment. So that way, when it goes away, when you start thinking about something else, whether it past or future, or you, you are thinking about right this second, but something else, you're here now, but you're thinking about something else. You actually aren't here now. If your mind is going somewhere else, that horse picks up on it. It's in a nanosecond. It happens faster than I can explain that it's happening. Whenever a person will consciously bring that thought and emotion into this moment and undivide their attention toward the horse and collectively do that over time, that feedback loop starts to get established. So when the feedback loop is distorted, you know, egg shaped, not circular, or it's just distorted, fuzzy and not, not really continual, the horse picks up on that. Mm -hmm. So breathing, that horse is taking notes just as much as we're taking notes. Every interaction, the horse takes notes on the person they're interacting with, internal pathway, external pathway. As the horse realizes collectively over time, I mean, even in a short two to three hour session, that horse is paying very close attention especially a Mustang, they analyze things, life and death. They're very serious about survival. So they, they're acutely aware of everything around them, especially the person. Once they start to get that muscle memory, the thought pattern, understanding any significant or subtle changes in that they take notes of it. So they start to learn and develop a deeper understanding of that human that is interacting with them. The Mustang is really powerful in the way that when a person has high anxiety and then they try to balance and come centered and they consciously breathe and they consciously relax and they consciously present that to the horse, the horse pays attention to that. So when they start to go off center and get anxiety, that horse makes a change in a nanosecond. And then the person can see the change and then the person can bring themselves back. So. Collectively, over time, they get better and better at doing that. And that's just one little brief example of what's happening. There's a myriad of things that are happening. Mm -hmm. But to give you the, the, the understanding of how a person can understand is the unseen communication. When a horse will take a deep breath and relax, they have just re reduced restriction in their mind and they have released tension in their body. The, I, I show a person, you should do that too. When they do that, you do that. And when you do that with them, there is just some information that is transferred internally through each of you in that feedback loop. And that's, that's about as close as I could give you of an understanding of the unseen information that transfers. Because as that session continues to go on and collectively over time, you can actually trigger that yourself. A person can take a deep breath and then the horse will take a deep breath. But the person is consciously being aware that their thoughts and emotions, attitude and action are under their control now. They can control their thoughts, their emotions, their attitude and their actions. Thoughts and emotions are the internal. Attitude and action are the external ways of communicating. 
Horses pick up on that very well. If we could control those four things and master them, then we could communicate with a horse instantaneous. I mean, a horse is ready and willing and available to, to communicate that way. They, they, they understand uh, when a person is in alignment. But the beautiful thing about horses is they understand when you're not and they can help you get there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's the yeah. <laughs> Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, yeah, that was that was really interesting, um, and that was explained really, really well. Um, thank you thank for you. that. Thank <laughs> you. So, I practiced um, it a lot. <laughs> sorry, you practiced. I know. I, I'm sure you. I'm sure you have. You definitely have. Um, so, can I just ask you? Um, so, you, one of your horse, your your horses, um, beautiful horse called Moonshine. Um, that you used to have. Can I ask you just to um, ha how you met and and your relationship together? Yeah, very fond of memories of that horse. We uh, we met at a Mustang makeover and um, 2013, and uh, I adopted him after the event. Actually, my wife wanted him, so she adopted him and uh, brought him home. And I really didn't, I didn't, I wasn't drawn to that horse in the beginning. So I didn't really want to have much to do with him. I already had a horse. And I uh, kind of just put him to pasture. And my son rode him for a while, but my son and he, he and my son didn't get along. Uh, kept dumping my son, you know, he'd, he'd bolt off real fast and just leave him on the ground. Oh. <laughs> I just noticed it a few times that it happened and didn't pay too much attention to it. You know, kids, they're going to do stuff. And, you know, I try to correct them, but I'm, I'm the dad. I don't know anything. <laughs> so I okay. Well, um, Moonshine had developed a, uh, um, an issue, we'll call it. I'd go out to catch another horse and he would just take off running from me and jump out of the pasture and go go off into national forest so i'd have to go catch him and bring him back and about the fourth time of that i thought you know what you're getting out of hand because nobody's even trying to catch you you're just running off out of i don't know if he's doing it for fun now that i look back on it it's probably for attention <laughs> but it, it was getting kind of an annoyance, you know, I'm running a trail ride business. I'm going to catch five or six horses to go do the trail ride and moonshine runs and jumps out of the pasture and I got to go deal with that. So it, it, it developed into a, well, I'm going to take this horse to a different location and expose him to people. So I had lots of clients coming in every week and I just explained to them, take these carrots, put them in this bucket, feed that horse, pet all over him. Just show him that humans are great. He doesn't need to run off and jump out of the pasture. And I was just extremely busy in those days to where I couldn't be the one to do it. So I did that for about two or three months and it worked. He liked people, you know, he didn't want to run from everybody. So <laughs> he went back in the pasture and just didn't, didn't have time to go into his training or anything. And uh, I had a friend looking for a Mustang, and she asked if uh, I would be willing to sell Moonshine, asked for him by name. She knew that I had had him. I said, no, nah, I don't really sell horses, but on second thought, maybe I'd sell that one. <laughs> so I said, uh, I'm not going to feel comfortable selling this horse to you unless I put 30 days of, of something on him, some sort of time interaction. Uh she said she agreed. So I started down the path of 30 days of training, we'll call it. But two weeks in, I realized that I was getting ready to sell one of the best things that ever happened to me. And uh, probably the most important piece to my whole horsemanship adventure. So I was trying to find a way to, to tell her, no, he's not for sale when when the phone rang and she said, hey, some things changed with the uh, boarding facility. I can't, I'm not going to be able to buy them. So it was fine. I said, okay. So the universe sorted that one out. <laughs> I hung up the phone and you know, 
No big deal. Yay. <laughs> but as I continued in developing this relationship with Moonshine, I realized that he was the one horse I needed that taught me the most about myself. And we were just pretty much identical together. Uh, horse, human, just identical. I, I got to invest a lot of time with him and we became um, probably best friends, you know, horse, human relationship, best friend. And uh, again, he taught me the most about myself. But one of the neat things is he prepared me for the horse that I have now, Sunshine. Uh, Moonshine was one of those, he was a, man, he's probably, he was a very deep teacher, just had a lot of depth to him. And uh, kind of one of those horses that was just not going to give up and trying to teach it to me. As hard-headed as I would be or was, he was tough. He would just keep keep trying to teach, keep trying to teach. And then one day I got it and I got off of his back and I sat down on the ground and I just stared at him. And if he could have talked, he would have looked over me and he said, that's what I've been trying to tell you this whole time. <laughs> <laughs> and man, it was, a, it was liberating, but it was also a great sense of responsibility that he gave me to keep going. Mm. He, he saw, I mean, um, yeah, he, he's, I, I'm just picking up on his energy because uh, when you talk about him, his, his energy comes around. So I'm, he's quite a strong, um, very a strong character. Is his, his own, his own person or his own horse? <laughs> if he was a person, he'd be his own person. And, um, he'll, he'll, Compromise is not a word that I'm getting with him, but he would meet you halfway, but you've got to work for that other half. Yeah. And that's the feeling that he's given, that he's given me now. Um, and, uh, yeah, very, very much still around. Um, and then it brings us on to um, Sunshine, who, who's um, very, from obviously what I see, he's he's very different. And um, yeah. how did you come, how did you, did you come about getting Sunshine? Well, I took Moonshine on a uh, trail ride, fall trail ride in Crested Butte, Colorado. And I'll try to shorten the story, but <laughs> Moon, that was kind of a, a climax of Moonshine and I's relationship to where I rode him brideless up a trail, eight miles up a trail to a high mountain lake. And uh, that's the first experience I ever got to have with a horse where it was just mind to mind. It was the only, the, the only way of communicating on that eight miles was through the internal pathway, thought energy. And in doing that, I had some other people witness it. And they were so amazed that they were trying to tell me about another horse, but I wouldn't listen. I explained to him, I'm not interested in another horse. I have the horse that I need. I, I don't want another project. I don't want, I don't even want to hear it. So I was that shut off. You know, I just shut them off. This was like in September, or October timeframe. As time went on, uh, I was a featured clinician and, Rocky Mountain Horse Expo in Denver for five years. And I was preparing Moonshine to do this show in February. And uh, I had a health certificate done on him on Thursday and he died on Sunday. Mm -hmm. So that was about two weeks before we were supposed to show in, in March at the expo. So I, I didn't have a horse. I had one in training. He only had 40 days on him. He's a little Mustang out of Colorado too. And uh, he wasn't my horse. He was a horse the rescue had. And I, I was training him so he could get adopted. So with 40 days of training on that Mustang, I showed him in front of 4,000 people, but 
I just put a chicken suit on and rode around and had a good time. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I saw that video. Yeah, I did. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I was pretty torn up when Moonshine passed away, and uh, I found I found relief in laughter. So that's why I did that. I just wanted to make people laugh. I rode this little forty day horse, and I didn't care what he did. We just had a good time. But the people that helped me put on that show, they were support team. And uh, I had had a vision of a Palomino Mustang keep coming into my mind and I didn't understand it. And I told one of my friends about it and he just kind of encouraged to go with it. And uh, he can he confided in another friend that had saw what Moonshine and I did on that trail that day. And, and she said, uh, the horse I was trying to tell Justin about is a Palomino. And I said, well, get her to send me a picture of that horse. And when she sent me the, he sent me the picture of the horse, I almost crashed my truck because that's the vision that I had seen. Yeah. Wow. So, I uh, I ended up going down. I called the owner and I asked her about him. And she said, well, he's been wild for eight years. No one's touched him in the last two years. And two years ago when they tried, it ended horribly. So it was kind of music to my ears because mm-hmm. uh, I really, I, I always go into horsemanship with a horse the relationship with a horse and I look at it as what can I learn? What can I, what can this horse teach me to be better for the next horse? And if no one's been able to deal with this horse, I want to know why. So I went there and if, and if, if, if Heidi's on this, she went there too the same day. And when I saw sunshine, I got, I just went and jumped into this pen with them and we did some circles together and uh, probably about a few minutes of that, I got close enough to him and he grabbed me and, and he just compressed me to his body in, in like a hug. And uh, I got kind of emotional. And, um, yeah, so the Facebook user, that's probably Heidi. Yeah. And she, she was not, there. She's not, not clear. Yeah. And uh, she was there when I got sunshine the day I met him. And uh, it was a very emotional day for me. I bet it was. So I brought, I brought him home. And eight days later, I was riding him in the mountains by ourselves. And uh, a lot of beautiful things have happened since then. But that uh, sunshine kind of revealed to me that if I hadn't met moonshine, I probably wouldn't have been able to engage with a horse like him. Mm -hmm. See, they're not going to give those gifts to someone who's not worthy to receive them. Yeah. And uh, I just feel blessed that I was worthy to receive them. Well, I think it'd be, I think it's a mutual thing um, that you were, they they got you. I mean, um, Moonshine definitely had your, <laughs> so so you, you know, I, I've explained what I do. I don't know if how much you know I do, but. Oh, I'm I know. Just, I'm picking up now, and he he definitely had your number. <laughs> uh, Moonshine definitely had your number, um, and his his energy is, is very very proud and very strong, um, yeah. and he, he wouldn't suffer fools gladly. But he gave his heart, and that's what he's showing me now. That he, you know, once he give once he gave you his heart, that would be it. There'd be no going back. Um, but he would t- he would still test. He's saying he would still test. So when I say he's saying to me, that's what I'm picking up intuitively that he would still test. Um, 
and certain people he would see if they were worthy too so it's certain people in your in your um your your group your network he would play around with them there's there's a bit of mischievousness there um sunshine is is a different and so shut yeah when you i mean you've just said that anyway but he felt like he was a, a shut off and he was just like, he, he needs somebody to connect with his heart. Um, and that hug that you said that he gave you was just like, it was, it wasn't, it was not like, help me, but it was, it's here. It's, it's here, but it's, it's, it's hidden, it's deep, it's here sort of thing. Mm. Um, and sometimes it's hard to put into words what I'm picking up because it's not always, uh, it's not always word form, it's just... A, a, a deep feeling if that make if that makes sense to you justin <laughs> yeah. yeah sunshine's an empath empath um i realized it very early on and uh we did a program for children that were at risk of suicide from an indian reservation in new mexico and uh i could barely get my hands on sunshine at the time you know it was uh I could I could do it, but it was on his terms. So with these children, he he would let them do whatever they wanted, and uh, I had ne I'd noticed that. But then the more people that I would introduce to Sunshine, the more I realized, man, this guy reads emotion on the highest level I've ever seen. So in some of my therapeutic sessions that we do, and a person comes in here with deep deep trauma, deep depression, deep anxiety, whatever, I'll, I will ask Sunshine to help me uh, with them. So basically the worst cases that come through my gate, Sunshine is the one that it connects, gets them uh, through that door quickly. Mm -hmm. And to watch that horse do that, you, I couldn't, I can't explain what it's like to see it other than there's a term they call bliss. And um, it throws me into that. But it's very, that's very, and it's special. Um, and when you feel that as well, that's something that it's hard to explain. Like you said, when you see um, the veterans or the children work with horses, you don't speak because you, you see the interaction, you see what's going on but you also feel that energy change you also feel um you, you you feel it too and if i'm um sometimes when i'm going to when if i'm going to see a client and i'm i'm sort of passing on information that i pick up and also i'm sort of picking up on the energy now and sometimes I think I'm not really saying a great deal and and often I'll go to a horse and it's not what I say it's what they're feeling and it can be very few words and I think oh I'm not I'm not doing enough I'm not saying enough because you know that I've told them to be quiet while I'm just doing this and they're watching me and then I go you know and I'll sort of say what I need to say and they go no no it's fine we can see what's we can see you know I can see what's happening um but there's an interpretation that you think that you have to be, this, I'm talking about me now, that you have to s explain, you have to say. But actually, um, they can feel that too. People around you can can feel and sense that and then they, and they can see it as well. And sometimes, sometimes I think they, they, they feel it first and they're looking to, to find the, the the verification of what they're feeling and then yeah. it's almost and then they get it and then sometimes yeah. the tears flow and they and as the horse is breathing out they go yeah. <laughs> which is quite well, funny <laughs> what i've found is it happens faster than you could say it and sometimes it happens faster than you can think it mm. you know someone will start crying and and then they'll look up to me and say i don't know why i'm crying it's like it doesn't matter <laughs> Your body's, your body's doing it. Let it do it. Yeah. Sometimes they'll just start giggling uncontrollably. 
And then they'll look to me for, for an explanation. And I, I shrug my shoulders and say, don't, don't worry about it. Just go with it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it happens faster sometimes than, than you're allowed to understand it. And the releases that come that are visual, people want a justification for them sometimes, but it's not necessary. You don't have to have a justification as to why you cry when you, you, the day you play with a horse and then five days later you, you're laughing and five days later you're just at peace. It doesn't even have to be explained. It's felt. Mm. Uh, feelings that a person feels sometimes are never felt in their entire life until they interact with a horse. Sometimes they're from a past experience uh, or childhood. You know, they, they feel the same way as they did when they were a child. Sometimes they'll they'll put a time on it. They'll tell me, you know, I haven't I have not laughed in ten years, and I. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't know how many people have come here and told me that they haven't been able to concentrate on one thing longer than ten minutes, and, and be able to do that in the first interaction with a horse. Total undivided concentration with a horse for sustained ten minutes. And see, that's that's the thing. Is I, once that's going on, you, you can't ask them a question. You can't talk to them because so many things are happening, a myriad of things. The, the restrictions in the mind are getting, you know, freed up. The tension in the body is getting freed up. Heart rate is, is stabilizing with the horse's heart rate. Breathing, stabilizing with the horse's breathing. The second that an outside interruption comes in there and distorts that takes away from it. So if, if a person can concentrate 10 solid minutes uninterrupted and gain this energy transfer and this feedback loop that I'm talking about, that's when the truest form of healing in horse and human can happen. So nanoseconds of things, I mean, things are 50,000 things are happening simultaneously in that 10 minute period that that are on a micro level and you can't explain it as fast as it's happening if that makes sense yeah no absolutely god yeah yeah i think as as humans we we like to have an explanation and we like to analyze and and we like to think what happened there and we um but when you just um when you go with the flow uh in fact i find my uh, horse work, which I'm sure it's just with you, it, it's it's not just like your horse work and then your your private life and, you know, it's separate. It all intermingles and it helps you with, um, with your day-to-day life. And for me, if I just go with the flow and always follow my, my, my gut, my intuition and don't don't ask too many questions and think okay this is coming to my head I'm just going to go with the flow I have no idea why I'm doing this but I'm just going to do it anyway and the more I do that the more I can see where it's where it's leading me and I and and I find I find I still find it fascinating um and it makes me more aware now if I'm like at the minute things uh, obviously in the UK um I mean, there are people working still, obviously, but it's just you're trying to get through the day. We're not overthinking about things. And you see a lot of information and, and people say lots of things. You know, they, they all have their opinion, as you said. And you try not to absorb this. You try, you just, you, you're, you're listening to it, but you try not to absorb it. But after a while, it seeps in and then you notice that and you can feel the anger anxiety or you can feel there's a, a slight change and um, I notice if I don't which I have done recently I've been guilty of that so I'm doing my day-to-day stuff with my horse but I'm not having those um, as many moments as, as I have been doing and plus the weather's been really bad here when I say bad it's wet <laughs> um, it's yeah it's been wet so, and dark nights so it's a bit different but as it's getting lighter and you get to spend a bit more time, 
those moments are, are really important because it just grounds me and it just brings me back down to earth again. But I need to do more of those because I notice when I don't do it, if I do it quite frequently, it's part of the norm. It's when you don't do it. And this is what I explain to my clients. You can you can go see your horse. You can do you can visit your horse three times a day. You can do what you normally do. You feed your horse, you you clean the stall out or whatever, and you know, you groom your horse. You can do all that, but it's not the same as just being there and just doing nothing. And when I explain that to them and just say, you know, best thing advice I can give is just take a flask of tea go sit in the field just just observe your horses read a book so you're not focusing and you're relaxing and and then just take a note of what's happening your horses are are already communicating with you and they're listening and they might not be looking up because some people think oh my horse doesn't look up no doesn't know I'm here and I'll say yeah they do know you're there (laughs) they're just waiting to see if you're in it paying attention because if you're not going to give them the time of day why would they give you it and it's that sort of thing and um, it's lovely when you get feedback because just from a few little little tips that they say yeah I did that Um, but if you do it frequently it, it becomes the norm, but you notice it more when you don't. You notice with your own psyche. You notice with your own stress levels and anxiety. And, and um, yeah, it's a big, I don't know what I'd do. Um, yeah, I don't know what I'd do without my horse, without horses in my life. Yeah. They've taught me so much. I mean, they've taught me what I'm doing now. Um, and it's, yeah, it's, and it's always, a, it's an honour and a privilege um, to spend time with them. Uh, yeah sorry I went off on a tangent there this is about you not about me okay Um, (laughs) well wherever attention goes the energy flows yes absolutely. you mentioned these lockdowns but I haven't paid much attention to that no influences don't affect my inside anymore Mm. as much as they used to and I owe that to horses whenever you get to the opportunity and I'll just put it to my, whenever I got the opportunity to invest time with a wild, once wild Mustang out in the mountains, separated from society, it gave me the understanding that outside influences don't need to affect the inside of us. We choose to take that information in and what we do with it once it's in, matters. Yes. I'll give you a story one time with one of my oldest Mustangs, Whiskey. That's his name. They all come with alcoholic names. I don't even drink alcohol. But... Moonshine's a real alcoholic name. <laughs> yeah. So, so Whiskey, he and I were, were on a uh, five-day overnight pack trip. Five days, four nights overnight pack trip in the mountains and I was doing a scouting, scouting the land. I'd never been there. We went down into this deep ravine, deep, and there was flowing water in there, rushing water. And I, it was so steep. I got off of his back and I I led down this thing. And if, if anybody knows me and has ridden with me in Colorado, I never get off. I'll ride anything, anywhere. It doesn't matter. But out of the care and concern of my own horse, I I won't do anything that would would hurt them. So this was steep, rocky, jagged ledges just going straight down into a canyon. And uh, we kind of got into it before we could get back out of it. So I had to keep going. And uh, a fear came over me based on these outside influence, you know, things that are going on. They're influences. We're in a place that we could get really hurt. No one's going to find us. And uh, the fear was that I had hurt my horse and, and I couldn't get him out of there. So to get into this roaring water, I could jump over to this rock. No, no problem. I mean, it was like three, four foot away, but there wasn't much room on this rock. And my horse was going to have to go in this deep rushing water. And I'm, I'm, I'm feeling a panic come over me. 
of a fear and a panic of, oh my gosh, I'm fixing to hurt my horse. This is fixing to be bad. And uh, I had to climb up this other rock ledge that was about three feet, you know, probably about right here to my chest. I had to put my elbows and lift myself up and get up there. And my rein was as far as it could reach to the bank of where that water is. And my horse, I was asking him to please come through, but he was going to have to go through the water and go a different way. But with no concern on his body or his mind, he jumped onto the very same rock that I had just jumped on with all four of his legs. And I'm watching. I still have that leather rein in my hand. And then I'm standing up on that ledge that I just crawled up with with my shoulders. And that horse just launched right up there too. And it just looked at me like, yeah, hey, man, thanks for showing me the way. Wow. And I was like, that was the most amazing thing I've ever seen in my life. How did you even do that? And then we just walked up this other steep ravine to get out of there. You know, and in the explanation of this, it, it may be, oh, probably wasn't that steep, probably wasn't that bad. But I'm telling you, if anybody is watching this that's ridden horses with me, they know I'll ride the most extreme thing you can imagine. So when I explained to you that it was so steep, I wouldn't ride it. It's steep and it's dangerous and it's, it's, not, it's not a joke. And for that horse whiskey, just to have that wisdom and deep knowledge and confidence to do those things, it just shows you the outside influences can have an effect if you allow it to. And I could go on about hundreds of other stories to just back that up with horses, Mustang horses that I've been taught taught by. But these, these lockdowns and these politics and these opinions and all that, they're outside influences and we could choose to uh, absorb it and allow it to affect us in a way we don't want, or mm -hmm. we can absorb it and pass it on through and sustain control of our thoughts and our emotions, our attitude and our action. And whenever we don't get to engage with a horse, and I've explained it this way a lot of times, I feel, I feel sorry for people that don't get to practice with a horse because when we don't do it, when I don't get to do it, I do start letting outside influences affect the way I feel on the inside that I don't like. Yeah. So whenever a person comes through my gate and they want to engage in a therapeutic activity with my, one of my horses, it brings it back for me every single time. And I get to collectively learn and grow and develop with and from the horse to, to upgrade myself as a human and be better. For other humans yeah and to share with them the knowledge horses share with me and then to you know the, the ones that get to come here actually experience it for themselves very special very special very yeah they're amazing creatures amazing creatures i um i remember being at um we have um we have horse camps here where um, they go off for two or three days and they camp and they take the horses and they get to do um, things that they probably wouldn't um, get to do at home. So they do like cross country, they can have a go at show jumping, dressage and just build the confidence. And I was asked quite a few years ago, um, it was actually a client and, and she says, would you like to um, to attend a, a camp and, you know, do... do um, show them what you do with, with the with the campus. And I was, I was like, I'm not sure how that would go because she says do like little taster sessions. And I was thinking, I don't I don't know if that would work. You know, it's because at the time I was doing it, I, I had to get focus, you know, I had to sit there and and um, I was just thinking, what if I don't get anything? What are they going to think? And I said, well, we'll have a go. And she says, well, how about 15 minutes per person? I went, oh, my God, no, you know, 15 <laughs> minutes, I'm just drawing breath. <laughs> So um, she says, okay, 20 minutes. I says, well, do do 20 minutes, but allow to go over because if things are meant to come up, they're meant to come up and I'm not going to stop. So anyway, she, um, I drove there and I think I'd got eight horses booked in. And I was like, oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> it was 
how on earth is this going to work? I have no idea. And my heart was in my mouth. Um, somebody's just left a comment there. I don't know who that is. That might be. I'm not sure who it is because they haven't clicked on the um, permission. I think it might be Heidi. Might be Heidi still. Um, yeah, I still have Harley. You still have her. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so I, I drove up and uh, I went to see the first one and I was thinking, right, here goes nothing. <laughs> and I walked in and um, I just started doing it talking and, you know, I explained a little bit about what I do and just said, right, this is, this will be a condensed version, but whatever's meant to be talked about, you know, it will be talked about. And it, it was, as the camps went on, it was always relevant to what was going on probably in the, you know, sort of on that day and maybe a little bit more. And to my amazement, it it worked, but actually it worked pretty well because it was like boom, 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 one after another. And it was in the, I was in the flow then. And it was actually easier to do, to do it that way than to, to have one and then to stop and to have another because I didn't have chance to get the nerves because it was just keep going. And quite often there would be a similar theme. So, um, because I found myself talking to one person and then the next one would be slightly different and the next one would have a similar theme. And I'd be thinking, they would probably think I'm just reading off some information, you know, the same sort of thing. I'm just, I'm just saying the same thing. And then when I went to meet them for a coffee afterwards, because they'd all be chatting and they'd be all excited about the day, um, the feedback was like, no, no, that was, that, you know, that was fine. That was actually what was going on. But each camp had a, a similar theme. The horses seemed to have a similar thing going on, a similar, um, a similar, oh, yeah, which was was quite bizarre. And then when you talked to the trainers that they were they were having interactions with, they would sort of have a similar thing from their perspective. And then sometimes, as they got to know me, they'd say, can you just come and have a chat with this horse and see what you're getting? Um, and then I sort of relate it, uh, relate back to the, to the, to the owner. But I, I loved it. And that was, a, that was one of the best training grounds for me. Because I thought, if I can do that, just go in there and do that, then this is what I'm meant to be doing because otherwise it, it would not flow it would not flow and I didn't have time to allow my head to get in the way um sometimes it would be quite funny because people would just have a blank face and they'd be looking at you and I'd, I'd be thinking okay this is not going well <laughs> and, and I'd be going does does that make sense to you and they'd go <laughs> but they were just like they just didn't know what to say and I was going okay so then I, I'd sort of inter try and interact a little bit more and, and sort of got them to um to say back to me what I they what I thought that they thought I'd said to see if it was if it was clear but I I loved it I, I absolutely loved it and it was the best best training for me um yeah best training one of the, one of the you know that's like testing into the fire if if you stand the fire then you know you're good you it lasts <laughs> one of the confidence builders i got one time was i never considered myself a clinician never wanted to be one never went to get training to be one but i was asked to assist one one time in new mexico and uh, i thought yeah that'd be kind of fun pretty confident and my horsemanship that I could share it with other people. And uh, I guess a little bit of ego back then, I really didn't care what other people thought anyways. Uh, I, I would just go and do what I do. And if they didn't want it, they didn't even have to take it. You know, uh, I kind of was a headstrong in that area where I'm just going to serve the horse first and everything else is secondary. And in agreeing to be a wingman, we'll call it, to another clinician, I, I figured, well, he's going to be doing all the, the heavy lifting. I'm just there to support anyway. So, yeah, let's do it. Well, two weeks before, he, this guy breaks his arm, falling off a horse, and uh, the event coordinator called and said, uh, you're the one. You're going to be doing the clinic. <laughs> Thought, okay. She says, uh, 
The other clinician generally wants gentled horses to come in and he can demonstrate what he does with them. And I'm a wild horse trainer, so I thought, well, why don't we have some horses that that are that need help with something, you know, that have a problem? Let's get those kind of horses. She said, okay, so I show up to this event thinking it's just going to be small, little town of Chama, New Mexico. Um, and to my surprise, it was like 2,000 people. Wow. They set it up in the center of town, and it's, it's during a, a big event called Territorial Days where they advertise it in major magazines, and all these people ascend upon this town in the two days that we were doing the clinic. And we're set up right in the center of town with a loudspeaker off of my mic that goes through the entire town, whether they're watching or not, they hear the clinic. Uh, it got so big. So the first day I should, should say they brought in a, a string of horses that none of them had halters. They backed up a stock trailer to a round pin that joined my round pin. And they just opened the gate and let about 12 horses run around. And I, I was so young and new at it. I, I didn't really recognize that, wow, that should have probably been a red flag. None of these horses have halters on them. But I, I guess just being young and naive, I didn't, I didn't know. So I, I asked them to bring in the first horse. And I move him around and create draw and put a halter on him, played with him, got up on his back, rode him around in a lead rope and halter, sent that one away next and after about the third horse fourth horse the crowd had swelled pretty big it was an rvs and people on their lawn chairs is like nascar you know they're up on their rvs and their lawn chairs watching the cars are lined up the people are lined up it, it, it's big and i remember thinking wow this is kind of intimidating i i did not realize there was going to be this many people and they're everywhere Everywhere I look, there's people just standing. And most of them spoke Spanish around that are real close. I couldn't understand what they were saying. Well, after, after about the fourth horse, I was just starting the fifth horse, and a guy said, do you understand what they're saying, the people? I said, no. He said, they're amazed at what you're doing because this guy just brought you wild horses they've never been touched they've been on a pasture their whole life and they're they're wild and and i thought wow would i have done anything different had knowing that probably not but it was the same issue with every horse they just needed to be invited into the human element properly and i was presenting correctly to where they were willing to do it no pain no fear asking the horses to allow me to do the things that they were doing with me. So riding them around on bareback with lead rope and halter in front of a big crowd, they were totally fine with it. So uh, I got labeled as the best horse trainer in the world. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that's uh, one of those things where our own artificial barriers will get in the way and worrying about what other people think whenever you let that go and just present your purest self to the horse that horse is so brilliant and so special that they make up where we fall short and give us confidence to continue going they know they kind of know what we need as we need it mm -hmm. and they step up willing and available if we ask properly, if, if we're, if our motives are, are, are pure. And mine was just, I wanted to learn from the horse to help the next horse. Just show me what I need to know so I can help the next guy. And they are just ready, willing, and available to do that. Every single horse. I've, I've got privilege to fly all over the United States, all many different states, play with many different horses. And I'm, I'm I'm just overwhelmed at the at the notion or the idea that I haven't come into contact with a horse that I couldn't communicate with. And uh, it's just, uh, it's a gift 
And it's a gift that I don't take for granted because I know horses can adapt to many different people, but people can't adapt to many different horses. The artificial barriers within us will, will not allow, will not allow it. You have, such, it you have such a nice energy though, Justin, you, um, you know, when you, when you're, uh, I, I, like I said, I, I came across you, I, I was looking for something and, uh, and you, you sort of popped up and I'm a great believer that things come along for a reason and it might lead somewhere, it might not, or it might be just a, a trigger, it might be like a light bulb moment or, or something that you see in them that you, that you, that there's inside you, there's a, maybe a slight something inside you or whatever and you have such a nice, um, energy about you, a nice soft energy, which animals, horses especially, are so sensitive that they, they, you know, they know your authentic, um, and your work, and you're working from the heart. That's what I want to say. That you work from the heart. And I had um, there's a he's a friend now, but he came over from uh, America. And he um, he works with horses, but he was looking to do some work in the UK. And I think it was a a lady had met him on it was on a ranch holiday, and she says you should come over to the you know UK and do some work. And he says do you do you think so? And she says yeah yeah. So she cut long story short, she organised a trip, and he and he came over from the states. And I was desperate to have somebody to help me with my horse because. Um, I, I I could do so much myself, but I my confidence um, was just yeah it was just it was just gone as far as to get on her and I wanted to just sit on my horse and to me um, to sit on a horse is a privilege and it's such a an awesome and just an amazing feeling the connection mm -hmm, yeah. yeah just even for a few seconds to me it's like I've won the lottery I don't care if I'm not walking around I'm just sat on my horse and that's yeah. like gold just to me and but it wasn't my issue which I knew deep down wasn't necessary to do with horse related something was stopping me progressing and that's where the horse work comes into helping with your day-to-day -day life because it stops you progressing in other areas too Anyway, he came over, but before then we was um, corresponding, and I could just tell he was just a genuine guy. And he says, you know, he says, don't don't beat yourself up. We'll we'll get you there. Don't you worry. Um, I said, okay. So he came, and I just I just knew from seeing him that his energy was so genuine, and the horses that he met and and Toots, my mare, she just. He, he had to work for it because he came in a little bit because he was new. So I think like you said about when you was younger, his energy was my, maybe a little bit. And he said, I think my energy was a bit high. I think I was trying to prove something because obviously I'm new here. He says, so once I dropped my energy, she was like, okay, I'll work with you now. Um, yeah. So, and, and animals and especially horses, they just, they see that from miles away. They see that before you get there. So, and I saw that when 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 I saw you working, I thought that's that's a genuine from the heart. Um, and yes, you know your stuff, but it, you can know your stuff. And if you're not working from here, don't always make a difference. You know that you'll you, you and especially now, I think people see through that. People see who's genuine and who's not. Um, and I don't know why I started talking about that, but I have. <laughs> <laughs> It, it circles back to the in, internal pathway of communication. You know, uh, horses, they're picking up on that probably more than they're picking up on the external. You know. Yeah. The, and when you're when you're in that moment and you're in that flow, it's it's as it's as clear as day. For, and sometimes when I work walk away from that, and then it's then when I question, did I? Okay, did I? Not so much now, but when I used to, I was like, what if I didn't get that right? What if my head took over there? And what if I was, so I get, I used to not sleep at night because I was like paranoid that I'd given the wrong information. You know, I, I would, I really would. And then I would contact saying, is everything okay? Did, was that clear? Did I make it clear enough? And there was like, yeah, yeah. Because my interpretation or my, my perspective or what I think happened can be slightly different for them. But they still get the message because 
it's the energy that that's um that is communicating between them so that they've got it anyway but i i'm thinking i've not done enough but when i'm in it when i'm when it's flowing it just flows and there's no i don't question it's when i come out of it i question sometimes but not so much now <laughs> yeah evaluating experiences that's that's a normal thing to do mm. especially when you care yeah yeah definitely right so i'm going to just ask you a couple of because i'm sure you'd be wanting to get off now because we've been on an hour which is lovely i mean this is just flying by for me um so we've done about the veterans um okay so so there is one here is that you've put how do horses help people overcome um alcohol alcoholism which was an yeah. interesting. I put a question because the question might next to that one. So how 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 does that work? Well, from what I've understand, is uh, people will get into a a repetitive thought pattern, and sometimes they don't appreciate that thought pattern. And for for example, maybe they've gone through a traumatic experience. And there's a myriad of those that we could choose from, but just say a traumatic experience. And it starts out with a little thought one day about that traumatic experience, and the emotion that comes from that thought, and the attitude and the action. And then the next day it's a little more. And then they start to get into a repetitive thought pattern and they can't control it. They're like, I don't, I don't like the way that thought makes me feel. I don't like my attitude from it. And I definitely don't like this action from it. When a person gets into that repetitive thought pattern and repetitive emotion and attitude and then the action, they want to suppress it, change it, or stop it altogether. Worst case scenario is suicide. You know, we call it a death spiral where they just can't stop thinking about that intense thought that causes the intense emotion, that causes their attitude, that causes their action to not be what they want. So they'll turn to alcohol and it'll cause a gap in that thought, repetitive thought pattern. It causes a suppression of it. It, it, it gives them a sense of release from it. But you know, and I know, and anybody with any intellect that knows about alcohol, you got to keep doing it. You got to do more of it. And then the, the peripheral damage from that far exceeds the initial thought pattern that they were trying to avoid. So now they've got alcoholism and they got this thought pattern and they, they, they're a mess. Horses will bring a gap into that whole vicious repetitive pattern. So what I've seen some of the guys tell me and what I've done for my own self, like I said earlier, I haven't drank a drop of alcohol in almost 20 years, but I've been playing with horses for 20 years. Anytime a thought starts to come about in a person that they don't want, especially if that thought causes an emotion that they don't want, and then the attitude that they don't want, and then the actions that they don't want. They've got to bring that into consciousness. And in interacting with a horse, they can realize, I can get the same gap in this repetitive thought pattern as I did with alcohol or drugs or whatever. But this has residuals that are give me peripheral benefits as opposed to, you know, a drug or alcohol that gives me peripheral damage. In those peripheral benefits, they'll start to sleep better. They'll start to be able to trigger body responses of relaxation within themselves. They'll, try, they'll be able to gain control of a thought rather than be under the control of a thought. When they're in control of a thought and emotion and their attitude, and their action. They have the power to say, I'm not going to go drink. I'm going to go play with a horse. 
or I'm going to take my mind into something where I control, and then I'm going to change the emotion that I want. And some people, they'll, they'll kind of ask me, well, what do you do when you, when you want to change your thought? The most powerful way that I've found is if I can't be with a horse. See, every time I walk up to a horse, an overwhelming sense of gratitude comes over me. I'm so thankful that I'm in the presence of a horse. I'm so thankful that our creator created the horse and allowed me to be in the presence. The gratitude overwhelms, overrides any other thought that ever could come in. The emotion that comes from being thankful that I have that horse is, is relaxation, is calming, is peace. The attitude is good and uplifting, energetic almost. And then my action is positive. It, it's what I want. The action is continue to go with the horse, to continue to be with the horse, to continue to upgrade myself, be better, increase my ability to see and hear and think and taste and touch. If, if a person realizes that that's what's going on, they're not going to that alcohol. And many of the people that have come here, they, they say that. They say, used to, I didn't have the power to, to choose to make a choice. There wasn't any other information to make a different choice. So I, I would go back to the alcohol. And they're almost powerless to it in that regard. Not that they're powerless to that, that actual 12 ounce can of beer or whatever. They're powerless to the thoughts that they can't cause a gap in, in any other way. Horses are so powerful and the ability to cause a gap in those repetitive thought patterns that a person doesn't want, that they would be able to replace, gain control and replace that thought so it doesn't get repetitive in a negative sense. The thoughts that they'll have and be able to call upon are from the horse. They, they sleep better, they can relax, they can laugh. They can cry. They can have a human characteristics and understand it's natural, not suppress them, not try to take synthetics that man made to suppress them. So that's the nutshell answer to that question. Yeah, no, that's fascinating. Actually, I could have, yeah, I'm sure you could go uh, quite a lot deep into that one. Um, I mean, my, my own mare, she, if I'm out of a line, which is, which it, to be honest is quite often at the minute, um, she, she tells me, and, um, I mean, especially the more time I spend with her. So I, I find more so in summer when you've got more daylight hours and, and the ground's drier and you can do, you know, when I say do more, just spend more time after work, I'd go sit um, until it gets dark and just, you know, just sit with her or do something, but mainly sit with her and, and watch her. I love watching them and watching them um, just grazing. And there's nothing so relaxing as munching on hay. It's just such a, just a nice sound. It's so therapeutic on its own. But if I'm, um, if I'm feeling a bit off and I'm wanting to interact with her and I'm, I'm, Basically, I'm wanting a hug or something because we can't hug anybody at the minute. And she's she's almost like, you know, sort of sort yourself out first before you come near me. And I'm like, oh God, I know. And I and so I have to go back in and reflect and think, right, what, what you know, apart from the day-to-day -day stuff, what am I not dealing with? And yeah, I mean it goes it goes more beyond that, but that's she she really tells me and I have to address things and if there's something going on with her there's something that's happening there that's happening with me so again she's it's not an exact mirror but it's there's a, there's something that I can see and I think it's right a subtle and, change or an obvious change yes and it causes us to recognize what's going what on presenting. what are we presenting what where have my thoughts been to cause my my body to posture this way that the horse picked up on. 
Yeah. Am I walking and hitting the ground harder as I'm coming at them? Yeah. Are my shoulders more forward and down? Are my eyes down or my eyes up? You know, it, it causes us to, well, what are we presenting to the world though? physically and mentally? What are, where are we? Yes. And of course, a Mustang commands that you be aware of that. If you are not aware of that, they're going to give you feedback and you will see <laughs> that you're not aware of that. <laughs> I, I remember one day it was we, it was a nice day and I was going to have a play. I was going to do some things, but I had to sort something out in a in a field in a paddock. And then the phone went as I was talking to a friend, and then I was doing something else. And she was she was eating the grass, but she was watching me, and I could tell she was saying, "Are you ready? Are you coming? You know, are we doing this? Are you coming?" So she carried on doing what she was doing. Then everything finished. I thought, right, I'm ready now, Toots. I walked up to her, and she almost said. Uh uh, I've been waiting here for 20 minutes. If you think you want to play now, and off she walked. And I just burst out laughing because I knew that was, she didn't say that to me, but that's what she was relaying. No, you didn't yeah. give me the attention, so don't expect me to do it now. And she walked off. But I just burst out laughing because I just got it. And yeah. I just thought, yep, that's my fault. Um, and I love those moments. I, you know, I, I, I love those moments. But, do you know, Justin, this has been really, really nice. Thank you so much for for chatting. I could chat for hours. Is there anything that you want to, anything that you'd, you want to sort of add or? Um... No, just thank you for, um, I do apologize that it's taken so long. You know, transitioning from Colorado to North Carolina, you know, I, I try to build infrastructure. and It just so happened I was going to be in the office all day today. So I'm glad that I could join you. No, it's fine, and if it's if it was meant to happen before, I know when I came out to uh, to to the to the states a few years ago that we tried to meet up, but we had the snow in the mountains, and um, yeah, because yeah, I I got to um, I got to meet Carol you, Carol um, and Boss. Oh. Can you? Yeah. Um, unfortunately, he's he's no longer here now, Boss. But I I got to meet him, which was was that was really nice and I just went on an impromptu visit because I was um, staying at um, Happy Dog Ranch um, so I drove up there and we ended up doing a session which was really really nice but it was just so nice because I met Carol through the group um, yeah. that you had um, and I got to meet her her Mustang and he was yeah he was a lovely lovely boy but yeah. thank you so so much um it's been a pleasure and yeah and i'm just i'm just glad we got around to chatting so it's yeah we've been on an hour and 20 minutes so <laughs> thank you very much so what i'll do is i'll um download this and then i can send this to you and if you want to to okay. use it you can but um I'll share it be, on my page it'd be really nice to um it would be nice to do this again but to actually to when you're actually working with your horses that would be lovely if you want to do that sometime yeah. Um, so we can try get to see you actually actually working the, the horses. Okay. We'll try yeah. to do that. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Justin. And um, yeah, Thanks really, really appreciate it. Thank you very All much. Right. Take Thank care. You. Bye. Bye, bye. So thank you, everybody that came on. Oh, I just missed that one. So let me just make it kind of. A comment. Yes, thank you to Justin and thank you to everybody that's uh, that watched. Um, I'm sorry that I didn't get to know who some of you were because if you don't click to give permission to StreamYard, they can't put your profile picture or name up, obviously for you know confidentiality. But um, yeah, that I was really pleased about that. It was so nice to chat to him. A really nice guy. Really comes across really, really genuine nice guy and uh yeah i hope that came across to you so thank you very much if you want to get hold of justin um you can go to his page justin done uh, horsemanship uh, american mustang school you can find that through google all right i can put a link link in later so take care everybody thank you very very much for your support and i hope you enjoyed this interview take care and bye for now